Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to another podcast here at Film Trooper. I want to apologize. I've been sort of off the air, if you can consider being on the podcast on air. Um, Just going through some family difficulties. Um, My father passed away recently, and that's sort of threw my whole schedule out of whack. So, but I'm back now, and I hope to get these podcast episodes out to you on a regular basis as I had before. With that said, this podcast episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. Just go to survivetheimplosion.com for all the details. It's available in paperback, a Kindle ebook or an iBook, as well as an audiobook. And in fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you sign up for audible.com for 30 days with their free trial. Again, just go to survivetheimplosion.com to get your free audiobook version. In today's episode, I speak with independent filmmaker Chris White over in South Carolina. Um, so a lot of you may not have heard of him, but one of the reasons I wanted to have him on the podcast was that I was very interested in how he's making a f- go at it as a full-time filmmaker, making a living as a filmmaker in his hometown of South Carolina. And what you're going to hear in today's episode is a lot of very interesting marketing ideas that could be applied to your project. And be sure to stay to the end because I asked Chris about these two very interesting stories, one about his involvement with the Star Trek fan film series, as well as his involvement and working with director Ryan Johnson. Now, Ryan Johnson went on to make Brick and Looper, and he's making the new Star Wars film, Star Wars 8. So it's an interesting story. Stay to the very end to hear all about it. Without further ado, here is filmmaker Chris White here on the Film Trooper Podcast, where I hope you can get a lot of marketing tips that can be applied to your own efforts in your own filmmaking career wherever you are, even if you're not in Hollywood. Enjoy. I've I've been in uh, I was uh, trained in theater, you know, from high school, college. I was a, a drama major, uh, did a lot of acting and directing in the theater, and uh, grew up in the south, the south of the United States, in South Carolina. And one thing that was, uh, in retrospect, is kind of discouraging. I didn't realize it at the time so much. I just figured it's what I was supposed to do. I couldn't. If you were a creative person. Um, <laughs> it was like, uh, the only, the option for you was to move far away or get a job at an ad agency. Ah, uh, yeah. It's like, it was like the way you could somehow do the stuff you did and maybe somebody would pay you. So well, in my twenties, I worked in advertising, um, well into my thirties, um, as a copywriter and, and I would direct commercials and, you know, did the visual, uh, I was a creative director ultimately. Then I, I got burned out on selling other people's stuff and decided I'd try teaching and taught film criticism and drama at a public high school. And and that was um, fun and interesting, I, I but I became poor. And so I figured, <laughs> <laughs> I figured uh, but, but something else kind of special happened at that moment. This is about 20 or 2009, 2010, and this is when HD or DSLRs really became, you could get your hands on a DSLR and you could uh, shoot um, you could shoot video, um, you know, in high definition and with different lenses and you could achieve a real cinematic look. And I, I just thought, man, you know, uh, at the time I was about 40 and I was like, I've always felt like maybe I'm too late to do something in this or I missed my chance in my 20s. Mm-hmm. But I was like, uh, it occurred to me that I had a lot of experience in advertising and marketing, education, and uh, I knew how to tell stories. Like I knew how to write. I knew how to work with actors. I knew how to lead teams. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but then I figured out I know how to raise money or do a good meeting, you know? Yeah. And um, so suddenly it seemed like, well, maybe the t- timing's exactly right. You know, maybe this is the time. So I kind of did a it's it wasn't crazy or foolish but it was risky i just i quit teaching and i became like an entrepreneur a creative entrepreneur overnight now i didn't just 
start making a movie the next day, but I, you know, I, I got some copywriting jobs and some, you know, uh, advertising marketing kind of jobs, uh, to keep the doors open, a little bit of teaching. Um, but eventually, uh, my wife, Emily and I, um, started producing, uh, at first, like with most people, I think we, you know, we produced a couple of short films and experimented with, you know, that, and then we, in 2011, we produced our first feature called Taken In. Mm-hmm. In 2012, we produced another feature called Get Better. Now, these are like $5,000, $10,000 movies. Right. But feature length, right? And then uh, in 2014, we had kind of a little regional festival hit with um, a film called Cinema Purgatorio. I was going to ask you how to pronounce that because I was having a hard time. Yeah. Purgatorio. Yeah, it's obviously we're we're making a little riff yeah. on the name of the movie Cinema uh, Paradiso, but um, it was it was semi autobiographical. My wife doesn't act, um, so we an actor another actress played my wife, but I was in it and I played me, and we wrote it together, and um, I directed it, and um, that's when it it started feeling like um, we were having some success outside of you know, our town and our region, but the whole, um, and then our, I, I can talk about future projects, uh, later, but, um, the whole, um, premise of our, I guess, first three or four years doing this full time was that is, is that, uh, acknowledging that we're not famous <laughs> with the world, right? Yeah. But that we are famous with some people like, I know you now, Scott, yeah. and you know me, so we're kind of famous to each other because we know each other, right? Right. right. So, and we just started looking around. And we're like, we know hundreds of people, right? And, and not just through Facebook or whatever. We just we knew people. Now that's a tool, you know, that we use to connect with people. But we decided we would be filmmakers. We would produce movies for people we knew. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we started, and it's it's dumb. Like I would never tell my friends, hey. I'm famous for you, you know, but <laughs> you understand, yeah. the, the idea being that we had fans, uh, that were friends, you know, and then from there we just built layers on layers and layers of that. So that now we have thousands of fans, friends, people that care about what we do. And it's a good place to be, um, artistically and financially at the level we're, we're working at right now. So we, you know, maybe it's like having a base of support um, for your work. Yeah, definitely. Let me ask you: with South Carolina, this is, is were you born and raised in South Carolina? I was born in Tennessee, but raised in South Carolina. I was, uh, grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, which is right in the center of the state, and it's uh, the capital. And now I live in the upstate of South Carolina in a city called Greenville. I see. What is the what is the magic to you about? I've never visited South Carolina before, but um, is there a particular reason that you, there's a calling for you to, to stay in South Carolina and not move to like New York or you know Los Angeles or anything? That's a that's a great question. Um, well, I have three children who um, are in school and stuff, so it's important to me to be around them and to be you know to to set a hometown and a place for them to grow up mm -hmm. you know that's value i had and wanted to keep um but also going back to my who am i famous with um um idea this is where the people were that i was famous with you know from pretty much from atlanta to charlotte to Asheville, north carolina down to columbia and now into charleston south carolina uh there are a lot of people who know who i am and respect what i do and are interested in what i do as opposed to if I if I move to Dallas or Chicago yeah. or, or Los Angeles, so it's it's more like just considering you know a base of operations where I won't be discouraged every day. But, yeah, this was this was kind of <laughs> cool. I'm sure um, you know when I talk to friends, like I've had a lot of success with crowdfunding mm -hmm. projects and um, have raised good good numbers over the years and. When I talk to my friends in Los Angeles about crowdfunding, they're like, man, you know, we can't raise any money and we can't, you know, everybody's doing this and we, we can't break through. But like, I'm one of the, 
it's more now. Obviously, a lot of people are doing crowdfunding, but certainly in 2011, 2012, yeah. I mean, nobody here was doing that. So it was really unique what we were doing. And, and two, by focusing on, you know, all my friends here aren't filmmakers. All my f friends here aren't actors or writers. Right. They're like normal people. So, <laughs> and I say that as an actor, writer, you know, I know that I'm not a normal person, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so it was just like, Hey, you know, maybe the secret will be, we'll, we'll sneak off and, 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 uh, make movies here in South Carolina for a while. And then, then we'll see if down the road, uh, we need to be somewhere else. I, I love South Carolina. I like being here. I like making movies here. Um, but it's not like I have to be here. It's just it's just where I am now. And the other thing, Scott, about being here in South Carolina is I don't have to be uh, the best filmmaker in the world. I can be learning stuff and growing as an artist and experimenting. Um, and, and this is kind of like a good place for an incubator. Yeah. To to try things that maybe I you know wouldn't fly in um, in Los Angeles or or you know. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I'm I think I'm good at what I do and I understand what it is I do and what I have to offer. But I'm not the most uh, innovative, creative, amazing, most talented, most fascinating uh, filmmaker, film artist in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just exact. I'm just like a perfect, perfect Chris White <laughs> doing Chris White things. And so um I don't know. It's 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 been useful. It's been helpful to be here, and uh, not to mention Atlanta happened. Yeah. The past couple of years. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. more and more we're doing work in Atlanta, and it looks like we'll shoot our next movie in Atlanta or in Georgia. So that's become like, uh, uh, you know, I live two hours from downtown Atlanta. So. Oh wow! I didn't realize it was that close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so it's we're we're um you know especially in the past year, but more so even this year. You know, we kind of see that as as uh, maybe our second hometown. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, from like an outsider's perspective, like sort of when I'm, I haven't seen, I've only seen the trailers of your films when I, you know, I was looking at the sure. stuff, and um, I love black and white, so I love like the majority of your stuff has, you know, the black and white tone to it, um, yeah. and <laughs> aesthetics to it, um, but it looks very polished, and this and the same thing, but I also notice. Again, from the outside perspective, what is the cultural, um, you know, embracement of your films? Uh, because from the South South Carolina is, you know, from again the outside perspective, like the Bible Belt, or maybe maybe con conservative in some sort. Uh, I know that uh, one that on the trailers for cinema, uh, per go oh god, I'm gonna mess up. Help me, Purgatorio. <laughs> Purgatorio. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, it it was a the guys they're pitching you to begin like assistant director for this film that was a, um, I think it was a, a gay Christian science fiction. I forgot what it was again, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a gay Christian horror film. It's, uh, it's our joke about those are the, I think the guys, the, they're, um, filmmakers you would never want to work with in the film or, or pitching my character on, uh, yeah. Working with them on a gay Christian horror film. Right. And he's just like, what? <laughs> you know, what's that for? Um, all the hot buttons that you hear, all the 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 key the buzzwords, you know. Oh yeah, I was at a I was at a festival or something some somewhere. I heard a talk or something. And the person said, you know, the the genres you can make money on without having a star. I think. Ah, uh, right. The genres are gay, Christian, and horror. Yeah. And uh, I was like, our joke started being, well, if we get desperate enough, we'll just combine them all and we'll make tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a that's no, I um, I hear what you're saying. Uh, the idea of South Carolina reflecting or the culture of where I'm from reflecting itself in my work. Um, I think when I was younger, I was a bit more um, as a as an artist and and thinking about the things I made and the things I worked on, uh, home and place and like being from a place was important to me. Um, more so maybe than it is now. Now I just see it as being a, a, a reflection, maybe a part of who I am as an artist, because I, I have things I would like to say and things I would like to explore. And, and I'd like for my characters to talk about in, in our movies and, um, being, well, 
Cinema Purgatorio, knowing that I was going to make a, a feature for, you know, for about 50 grand. Um, I, you know, when Emily and I started writing it, we were like, let's make South Carolina part of this, mm -hmm. you know, because this is all we got. We're not going to, you know, travel somewhere. And so we made the key plot of the movie be these people trying to meet Bill Murray, who is <laughs> lives in South Carolina. Right. Yeah. So um, and we thought, you know, what can you see in South Carolina? You can't see anywhere else. And it's like, well, we have really great beaches here. Um, we have foothills, mountains, but we also have great beaches. So we try to make that all a part of our movie um, because it's it's where we're from, you know. But um, um, without getting too cultural um, or political, because I, I don't know, like, exactly how reflective I would be of South Carolina. Yeah. Um there's everything here, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess you know you in would encounter all. Ca if if you were living here, Scott, you would find friends. You, you know, there um, where I live in the state is a very um, uh, corporate business climate here because there's a lot of you know international business and the automotive industry is here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's um, it's it's maybe it's a little bit like most places you live these days in the United States. You you will find your community. You will find your people if you're looking for them. And um, but you know um, maybe I guess one way that being here culturally and all that maybe a way it's a positive a way it helps us mm -hmm. is that because there aren't a lot of filmmakers here and there certainly aren't a lot of filmmakers that are maybe ambitious for their work in the way uh, we are. Mm -hmm. I'm very aspirational with the work. You know, I want to make, I want to make great movies. Um, and, uh, and I don't mean that other people don't want to make great movies. I'm just saying I would like to work, you know, in the industry and make my living. I'd love to spend Hollywood's money on my movie. Right. So <laughs> my, my aspirations for my work are, are, you know, I have a high standard for our, my work. And when we make a film, we find the absolute best, most professional people we can possibly find within a, you know, hundred mile radius. Yeah. That's who we work with, you know? Um, so, so, but maybe being that we're one of the few people here, um, makes it seem more fascinating to people or interesting, intriguing to people, what we do. Um, but, um, you know, with the, the last film, which is, um, the, the film we just completed called Unbecoming, which is a anthology feature that we shot last summer. And um, we're, we're raising money for another film uh, that I can tell you about, but we just want to be busy. We want to get in the reps and practice. So we made this anthology feature, which is just a bunch of short films put together. But with that, we specifically said, you know, we want to be able to we want to make the movie within a 50 mile radius of our house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to, now we, we cheated a little because we got some, uh, you know, known actors to be in the film. I mean, we used a lot of local talent and then we went into South Carolina and Georgia for talent, but we, uh, acting talent, but then we got uh, a couple of actors who are quite well known to, to be in the film as well. So we, that, in that way we cheated, but for the most part, the film is, you know, when you watch Unbecoming, you will see where I live mm -hmm. and you see a lot of the, you know, the kind of, uh, Maybe you see uh, the characters. I'm calling that film a Southern Gothic comedy, which is, <laughs> yeah. is kind of cheating maybe a little bit because I don't think it's maybe as wicked as Southern Gothic, uh, the idea of Southern Gothic would be. But it's definitely a little strange and uh, maybe like a, a little David Lynch Southern movie. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's what I'm becoming like a little bit. Um um, so in that, I guess you would see the Southern thing, but you can hear in, in my voice, you probably hear some Southern accent as I'm speaking. And then you're probably like, well, but he doesn't sound like total Southern accent. So that's, that's probably what I am. Um, <laughs> I got you <laughs> culturally as an artist, you know? <laughs> very reflective of, of me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's neat because I, I, I get a chance to meet a lot of different filmmakers. And the one thing about a lot of the films that, um, you know, I get little snippets of is a window into the different cultures. We were talking about Atlanta before, and I remember uh -huh. seeing some films uh, coming from Atlanta and just seeing the diversity of cultures, you know, of, ra yeah. of yeah. ethnic races, you know, combined together. You know, it's just, it's really exciting in that sense because when you look on like Hollywood, I mean, my my family and I have a joke, like every time we 
watch like a CW program, they're like all gorgeous and white, you know? So it's like, yeah. it's, yeah. you know what I mean? But it's like, it's, yeah. it's the Hollywood machine. Just you go, gosh, like how, how many people would actually look like any like that, you know? And it's, yeah. but to see the independent side of things, it's like this window into the cultures, even uh, across, you know, across the pond. I mean, seeing work from the, the Middle East and in India, it's like, wow, look at this, you know, this raw, like independent stuff going on. But it gives you a little bit of a taste or a window to different cultures that you may have not seen or like the aspirations of those cultures. So that's why it was fascinating to me to see some of the work like, you know, I, I have not, like I said, had a ch chance to go to South Carolina, but uh, seeing the, the, the shots from the beaches and so on, but just seeing the you know, the artists that are yeah. that are part of your film. Yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about the black and white, and I think, you know, our first feature was black and white. Unbecoming, the thing we just finished is black and white. There's uh, a little bit of black and white inside uh, Cinema Purgatorio, though it's, it's primary in color. Um, you know, that's something where me, just as an artist and trying to get better um, visually, you know, in my work um, as a director, um, I'm drawn to so many of the uh, so many. Uh, well, I've, I've I've always been a fan of like Woody Allen mm -hmm. since I was a kid. So you're like, oh, this kid growing up in Columbia is a huge Woody Allen fan. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you couldn't get more different than Columbia, South Carolina. But I, I really like that. And then I I really love the look of his movies like Stardust Memories and uh, Manhattan and um um, 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 Broadway, Danny Rose. Um, in fact, one of our actors, Patty Darvinville was in, um, celebrity, another one of Woody's black and white movies. So I started watching those, most of those photographed by Gordon Willis. And, um, uh, I just, I, I did all this, you know, research and I was like, I want my movies to, to have that sort of shimmery, uh, um, black and white seventies film look. Yeah. And so we, we went for that. Now, is that a South Carolina thing? I don't. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's, it's South Carolina in that the artist is aspiring to um, model his work after someone from another place. That's you know maybe that reflects some ambition of somebody from a small town or a smaller state. But to me, it's just like that. That's like reflection of my love of cinema and my love of cinematography and my love of the images. Um, you know, the images that, that those movies, not the high contrast black and white, but the, actually the sort of grayed out middle ground of, of that, of those movies, um, are just terrific. Mm -hmm. I even mm -hmm. shot, um, Unbecoming, all of it was shot on a 40 millimeter lens because, you know, in my research, I just, you know, Willis liked to shoot on a 40 millimeter. Um, hmm. and so hmm. in our, in our film, you know, it's like all the pictures, all the frames, everything is like that uh 40 millimeter thing um not tight depth of field not everything's out of focus except this one thing but everything's in focus you know the the, the lens is opened up wide and we see we see things the camera's on sticks it's not floating around um this was you know that's that film you know visually and um so so uh whereas maybe some of the the voices and the faces and the places and the things people are, are talking about might feel Southern United States. Uh, I, I like to think that the, the filmmaking is ambitious just for cinema, you know, just, just for, uh, you can tell that the director loves cinema and, um, and, um, is being, um, concerned about that and, and, and exploring that in the film you're watching. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's, uh... I can tell you where you're getting at. It's uh, it's now that you mentioned where maybe the influence, you know, stems from maybe consciously or subconsciously sounds like a little bit more consciously. You know, I was just saying, where do you find a 40 mil lens? I mean, most people like have like their 50, their 80, yeah. you know, uh, and like a oh, little wire. <laughs> you should, the guys that shot that movie, every time I'd say, where's my 40, you know, like, they're like, man, it's, it's the same shot on a 50 and I'm like, no, it isn't same shot on a 35. No, it isn't. I want to see four O on the lens, you know, <laughs> just like, you know, it was a, it was a discipline for me, even like, uh, composing shots. Like I, I got to, by the end of the shoot of unbecoming, I knew based on where the camera was, what I would see, mm -hmm. you know, just the practice of that, what I would see in the, in the frame. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, I want to turn a little bit on to the marketing side because you had your, your background in marketing and copywriting. I was wondering uh, with your 
your efforts locally. Like you said, you started with like the people that you knew and then you've been leveling up, expanding that out within your local area plus the local regions, you know, nearby. Um, I see that you're on your website, uh, you know, chriswhitehq.com. Um, you do have a mailing list, um, but is is the email list uh, something that is part of your marketing uh, strategy? And because when I click on it, um, you know, you get, somebody has to, you know, fill it out like uh, quite extensively because it's like, you know, email address, address, because I'm assuming you you send them actually something physical. Uh, okay, yeah. So um, I don't want to inundate you with uh, stuff you don't want, but I do maintain a mail list uh, that I, I, I communicate with. Um, but, but see, our, our communicate. Okay. So let's look at it this way, mm -hmm. Scott. So now you're a fan, or at least you know about me. So now it's my job. And this is where a lot of filmmakers, I think for whatever reason, don't really want to explore this or, or be in this place, but I think it's essential. So now I've got to give you opportunities to engage with me in my work. Right. right. And not, and I don't want to just say, Oh, here's something I put on YouTube. I, I don't want everything to be free. Um, and I don't want everything to be, this is, this is important. I don't want everything to be for something for you to watch that I made because pretty soon you're going to just kind of get bored with that. You're just going to, or you're going to understand, well, that's what Chris does. He makes these videos and he sends them to me. And sometimes when I have time, I watch them. But what I, what I'm trying to do with you to get you from being a fan to somebody who's actually spending some money with me, if we want to look at it that way is I want us to have some kind of authentic relationship. Now, that could look like, and, and, and in that, I want you to, I want, I do want you to download a movie. I do want you to um, uh, spend some money. Uh, maybe it's a DVD or something that I'd send you. But really, um, I want you to come out and hang out with me. So where, where we've taken our cues as filmmakers is from independent music artists. Mm-hmm. So I want to go on tour. If I have a movie, now think about it. I have a movie. It's like a new album. And, and it could be a cheap, you know, a movie that I made for not a lot of money. Or maybe it's something I spent more on or whatever. But the idea is I have, you know, Chris has a new album. And it's so hard, if not, you know, impossible uh, when you're self-distributing, at least, to just get somebody to, you know, just to just click and spend some money, right? Mm. But what I've found is I've got friends, man. I've got friends. Maybe they'll be listening to this and I can say this to them. <laughs> never, they never buy a download. They never buy my movie. They just keep waiting for it to be free to them on Netflix, I think. And, but boy, they will put down some cash if we have a screening event. So like, um, with unbecoming, we're having a, a screening, a premiere of the new film, at an old movie theater in Tryon, mm -hmm. North Carolina, which is like up the road from here. I don't, I can't tell you for sure how many tickets I'll sell to that, but I'll probably sell multiple hundreds of tickets to an event. Now, um, I don't, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to pay me, uh, the ticket price for that event will range somewhere between there'll be tickets for around $10 and tickets about around $25. And those different tickets will come with different perks. And different things but basically you're buying the same thing you're buying a ticket to be in the room when the film is screened when the artist is in the room i'll be there some of my actors will be there we'll have like a an event you'll feel like you did something that night what what em and i have found my wife emily and i found over the last couple of years is that people want i mean i know this is hard like we think oh people don't go out and do anything but what people around here and by here i mean north carolina georgia and south carolina we've done screenings in tennessee um uh florida uh virginia what we found is people want to have an experience with art and and when you think about film and in the visual media it's just like you just turn on your computer and you go watch something Right. I'll probably turn on Netflix or Hulu tonight and watch something. And that's the extent of that experience. But when we're talking about people that aren't a bunch of famous people and aren't playing at the multiplex, then what we've seen, at least for people that are friends and fans of our work, is they 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 want to come out and hang out with us. They want to come out and, and have the experience of being at an event 
whether it's the official premiere or the state premiere or whatever, that that doesn't matter so much. It's more like that they went out and did a thing that felt valuable and rewarding to them. Yeah. And for me and my business, I mean, you you can pull out a calculator and do the math, but if I sell one hundred twenty five dollar tickets and uh, two hundred ten dollar tickets, say to the the screening of of Unbecoming, you know, this film I made for not a lot of money last summer. If I do that, then then I'm doing pretty well for one night, right? Mm-hmm. I'm doing better than I would ever do, at least financially, going to most film festivals, even if I won a prize at the film festival, you know? So that starts to look like, to me, that starts to look like a business model for an independent filmmaker. So that means if I can't, and right now, there are probably um, about 20 places in the world where I can set up a screening and go in the world, in the in the Southeast during the United States. I can go. But now I would include Los Angeles in that and New York because of just different things. But these are places I can go. I can do a screening. People will pay for it. People will come. And I make a little money for that. I'm not just giving it away. And I'm not just – and you know what? Uh, I'm not – investing in the hard cost of a DVD that somebody's handing me a 20 bucks for that I paid, you know, four or five bucks for it's literally I'm screening a film in a place. Now, sometimes, you know, I, I, I pay the venue or share the revenue with the venue, but every one of those cases is individually negotiated. And sometimes a lot of times people just, you know, I don't have to pay for venues. Right. So it's a cool event, you know? <laughs> um, so, so if you start looking at it that way, you start looking at it like a, a business model and you start looking at yourself as a band, then you start to see why, you know, you know, there are a few thousand people in the world that care about what I do and and respond to, you know, my calls to action. You know, hey, we, we're gonna do a screening in Columbia, we'd love to see you. It's like a band saying, Hey, we're playing a show. Mm-hmm. Come on and see us now. Uh, for filmmakers listening to this, I am doing all the other stuff that people do to break through in the industry, right? So uh, I am making contacts and uh, pitching for fellowships, and and uh, I want I you know I would love to get an agent uh, in Los Angeles or New York to rep me. Um, I'd like to have a breakout film at a festival sometime that just becomes a story. Um, I, 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 I do want, you know, somebody to say, Hey, we, maybe that guy could direct an episode of this TV show. You know, I do, I am pursuing that route too, but to my fans and friends, to the people that pretty much, uh, pay for me, pay for my life, you know, here with my family in South Carolina, I am serving up product, serving up events, serving, serving up experiences with me as an artist that are valuable to them. And, you know, on the other side of that, in the so-called Hollywood world, it, it does kind of matter how many Twitter followers you have. And it does matter how many people like that Facebook page. And when I'm talking to distributors about Cinema Purgatorio, one of the first questions is, what's the Facebook page and how many likes are on it? Well, there's a lot of them there because I've earned them. I've worked for them um, in, in going out with, um, you know, um, building relationships and experiences with fans and friends. I see. So the the uh, it totally makes sense. Like where you're where you're modeling uh, your efforts to you know it, akin to the independent uh, uh, musicians um, is the your way of collecting information or 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 communicating with your fans and followers within your uh-huh. region. Uh, have you noticed like one uh, platform working better than others? Is email vi- uh, viable for you, or is it a physical mail? mailer is that uh, viable or is it uh, twitter facebook you know all those types of things i'm just because not it's funny every every audience is uh, is not the same meaning that they all have sure. different ways that they like to be communicated with uh, sure. uh yeah young people like are not on facebook so like uh, you, you know you better be on snapchat or instagram or mm-hmm. tumblr or something you know but you know somebody older or you know a lot of filmmakers are on facebook or so on but then some other tech people, they just prefer, 
uh, gosh, anything that might be on Vine. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see where an audience might congregate more than other places. Uh, right. In your experience with the local community, what forms of uh, platform communications do they prefer? Um, email is still gold, I think. Um, I think people generally think that. And as Facebook has become more pay as you play, you mm -hmm. know, creators, uh, the thing that still holds great value is my email list, which I have a great email list and it's, it's real and the emails work and the people there open my stuff and look at it, you know? Yeah. So that's still number one, especially with crowdfunding. If we, you know, sometime we should, we'll, we, we can talk at length about crowdfunding, but I believe that crowdfunding is entirely, uh, your success in crowdfunding is entirely driven by your email list. Facebook is, is, is fairly useless. You know, I spend <laughs> most of my time on, I mean, I'm there yeah. and um, we work it, but you spend all your time like trying to trick Facebook. You know what I mean? You're trying to weasel around and figure out how to get people to even see you, yeah. you know? And, and it's just not, it's not that useful. Twitter is, is great for me for interacting with other artists, like to keep up with other people and what they're doing. Um, I'm more and more having more conversations uh, in and around Twitter. I am on Instagram. I'm, you know, this year I, I really made a point. I'm pushing LinkedIn because I was like, I had a place on LinkedIn. And then I thought, you know, the kind of people that I really care about, like the audience wise, like friends and friends of friends that are in the world and might consider spending money on coming out to one of my film premieres or like a screening somewhere. Um, they're like, people that work in the business world. And so um, maybe I should be there. So, you know, yeah. I've, I've tried to focus, you know, I'll, I'll try to do a, a, a timely, interesting, I think, post or share through LinkedIn. And I'm just really learning that world right now. I, social media is great. And, and I, 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 I think it's a great time for independents like me in large part because of that. But it's email is number one. Um, and, and the more personal the email you can do, the better, you know, when I did my first, one of my first crowdfunding campaigns in 20, early 2011, it was a Kickstarter campaign. And I think I had maybe 300 email addresses that I thought would work yeah. <laughs> for friends. And I made an individual like 30 second me talking to that person personally video. Hmm. That, that I, I mean, man, I went weeks and weeks where I would just stand in front of my camera. And, but I would say like, hey, Scott, it's Chris. Yeah. I'm making a movie. There's this thing called Kickstarter. Please, you know, if you got if you got some bucks to share, this would be great. Um, the more personal I can make it, the response rate on those videos, like, I, I mean, I literally made 300 of those that I sent directly through email to people. I think I probably had, I was closing in on 60% positive response to that yeah that is a that's a little golden nugget there that reminds me of um uh, gary vanderchuk who when he wrote the book uh right right it goes with jab jab mm -hmm. jab right hook and he did this huge book promotional tour of it but he said he did the hustle where he went through his personal email uh and went to every personal like contact and took the time to craft a letter uh, i don't think he did a video per se but he took the time to make sure uh, it was each one was personalized and, yeah. and, and just did the work and put the work in and put the hustle in to make it happen. That's why that's why my email address, which is a Gmail address, uh, it's even the email that's on my card. If if I handed you a business card, it's, it's always a Gmail. I don't want to seem like I mean, I could obviously anybody could have, you know, a, a company, you know, Chris at Paris Mountain Scout dot com, my film company. But I find it, it feels more authentic. It feels smaller. It feels more tangible. If you get an email from, from Chris White at his Gmail account saying, hey, Scott, you know, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. The new film is going to be in Atlanta next week. I hope you can come out and see it. We're at this really cool place. Um, um, you know, so, so yeah, the more, the closer to, to tangibly, physically touching someone, <laughs> Uh, is important and and likewise it's important to get out and get around and see people you know we have a lot of people that follow what we do in charleston south carolina which is great little professional film city but 
I try to go down there. Mm -hmm. It's it's a three hour drive for me, but I find reasons to go down there. I'll go see actors I know in plays, or I'll, um, you know, I'll go, uh, you know, to different kinds of events where I know I'm going to see people, or go to other people's film screenings down there. Or, um, I guess you know, one thing I'm dancing around here is this idea of film festivals and the value maybe or lack thereof that I that I see in festivals. I think festivals can be hugely helpful and or it's. But, you know, and, and I'm sure like many filmmakers who are listening to me talk right now, um, it's so frustrating, you know, to make something that that you're really proud of and submit it and you spend that money to submit it and then you don't get in. Yeah. You know, it's just a drag. And and even when something, you know, objectively is is kind of great, you know, these film festivals are getting thousands of entries. Yeah. You know, and they're not they can't take, you know even a hundred, you know, and, and they're trying to do their best, like, but it's so hard to break through there. Yeah. You know? And so if, if your if your goal, if your plan is to get found and discovered and, and to really have a hit at a film festival, you know, I've, I've had hits at, at film festivals and it was, it felt great. And I got a trophy and I got uh, a few times I've gotten money, but you know the drive home is still the drive home <laughs> to work, you know. And um, a lot of festivals that most regionally, like filmmakers that we get, there's thousands of festivals now, right? There's still only about you know maybe two dozen festivals where stuff can really happen for your career. The rest of those festivals are experiences where you're networking with people, you're trying to up your game, you're trying to see what other people are doing. Um, you really got to go. I know that a lot of people are just looking for a laurel leaf but you know um you, you to make those things work you got to go and you got to spend your money to get there and you got to you know there's so much that goes into that and i and, and i just say you got to have other plans right if if we're in this as a business and if it's a hobby or if it's a just you know a, a very pure kind of art thing you're doing that's totally different but you know i'm i'm trying to make a living yeah so there needs to be several different streams of ways we're connecting with audiences and getting our work seen and 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 uh festivals is certainly one of those but it's not it's not number one it's not my a-list thing yeah um what do you do um to uh build up your email list is it just physically going to the events having screenings and having like a, a fill like a chart or like a clipboard of people sign up or do you do anything online to drive traffic to a sign-up page? I, I I need to do better with that. I, I have a really great list right now that I'm that I think works for what we do, but I need to grow that. Um, I think that might be somewhere where um, the social media uh, like Facebook and Twitter can help because yeah you. It it is hard to find a new well like okay let's say I go. A few weeks ago, I was down in Charleston. I saw a play, and I met like three or four actors after the play, and we're hanging out and everything. So by the time I get home, I'm already friending them on Facebook, mm -hmm. so I know them, and and they're accepting whatever. The next phase in that relationship would be to engage them with, "Hey, I'm coming down to Charleston to show my movie. This would be through Facebook, but it'd be a direct message. I'd like you to to come out and see it." Um, send me an email and I'll send you information about it. Or um, here's a clip from it. You know, that, that would be a, a valid ask for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, that's, yeah. You collect things at the, the event, but here's another thing when I do an event. So whether I'm using a service like Brown paper tickets or Eventbrite, uh, that's how, I, that's how I sell tickets. Yeah. Well, the, the data funk, the, the the data you can mine from that is amazing like so you can i haven't used eventbrite or brown uh ticket what they call brown it paper brown paper ticket brown ticket yeah but ah. you are, you're able to see the actual email addresses for everybody who buys right and you can have i mean it's like an opt in i mean okay. if somebody somebody's going to give you the email to confirm their ticket you you capture it that way so that's that's another reason why events if i do a 500 person event and i capture emails from that event I put them, you know, they can uh, merge with my mail list. The things are the emails I already have, mm -hmm. you know, I discard. But anytime I do an event, you know, I pick up fifteen or twenty new names for my mail list. Anytime. And so that you know? 
bare minimum. So with the actual purchase of the tickets, that is a golden list because that's like that's not just somebody uh, signing up for your email to get something free. They 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 bought something. So right, it's right, it's a. Uh, like I said, that's what the Glen Gary leads are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, once I have that and I have that email, then I'm not going to bug those people. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to treat it like so respectfully. Like I think probably, you know, I, 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 I want to, I want to hit some kind of conversation with people at least quarterly. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to be alive making films, you know, in their in their minds, so that um, so that they are engaged with what I'm doing. Yeah, I can't make four films a year, <laughs> <laughs> so so I got to have reasons for those to happen. So sometimes it could just be like, hey, we're putting um, our 2012 film Get Better on sale, you know. Yeah. So we're gonna we're we have a digital download sale right now, and here's the reason. Oh yeah, by the way. Uh, I was in Los Angeles uh, shooting a, a film with Beth Grant and Stephen Tobolowski. Here's a picture of me on set with those two actors. You know, maybe they'll be in one of my movies someday. You know, something like that. Yeah, that's a way to engage um, um, with people in a way that, that doesn't feel like I'm taking advantage of them. Right. You know, what do you? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go what ahead. do you do? What is your strategy for these events? Like you said, like putting together like a 500 seat event is an it's quite our deal because you get have a 500 seat venue and you got 50 people and it looks kind of empty or because sure. i've done that before where like okay i had a good turnout but because the venue was so big it felt small yeah and then yeah. and then i actually yeah. went i made sure that i had an event that was a lot like it was much cozier so uh -huh. and then i had a lot you know so when everybody filled it out it just felt you know like it was more of a lively event so how do you go about the strategy of all these local events you put on to be able to sell tickets. Um, obviously it's not just like, you know, Hey, we're setting it up. Come on out. I mean, I, it sounds like you, if you've done the hustle to do 300 video emails to, you know, for your crowdfunding <laughs> campaign, I'm yeah. sure the same effort and your, your background in copywriting and marketing, what kind of strategy takeaways can other filmmakers, um, take uh, learn from, from your, your experience? Well, when, um, Okay, so when you're setting up an event, we, we you need to have some uh, reasonable expectation for how many people would be there. And you're right, we don't want to book a uh, hundred seat room and five people show up. Mm -hmm. It feels like a failure. Um, so, um, so, but at the same time, I think you. Okay, so you, you don't. I don't like going into places where I'm always trying because let's think about it. If I just said, Hey, meet me at the coffee house. We're going to show a movie. Yeah. Then I don't know if the coffee house, I don't know what the technology is on the site. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've been at a place where you're there with your buddy's projector, uh, your little speakers from your laptop at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pulling your hair out and you're trying to seem like a, a, a wise, smart filmmaker with interesting things to say to the people that have come there. So, yeah, you need, do need a bit of a street team. You need some friends that are going to help you manage the event. And sometimes that might mean sharing some money with them, you know, paying them. Um, but a lot of times it just means, no, you know, people just want to be a part of a fun thing. But um, and the event is going to, you know, uh, the event we're setting up for Try on North Carolina, the premiere of Unbecoming. We will ask uh, local businesses to donate things, you know, mm -hmm. if we're going to have wine at the, you know, a wine reception before the thing then we're going to ask for the wine for free. If there's going to be a, re car uh, a red carpet there for people to walk into the theater on, we're going to ask for that for free. We might, you know, red carpets are pretty cheap to rent. But, or um, if uh, we do like to give people the opportunity at one of our events to stand in front of the step and repeat and get their picture taken, you know, with with one of the actors or the filmmakers, you know, so they, you know, feel like they were at a thing. Okay. Okay, so I gotta. I'm probably gonna have to shell out for one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I think if you just keep your cost at an absolute minimum, you do find the new little bakery in town that nobody knows about yet. Who'll donate, you know, fifty cupcakes to the premiere, and you mention them from the stage when you introduce your movie. Um, here, here's something, yeah. Scott. It's really great. Yeah. Um, we did a screening in our hometown of Cinema Purgatorio. 
and it ended up being a totally sold out standing room only event and a really cool cabaret theater. Hmm. Uh, it was just great. It was a super cool event. And, um, but I, I knew that there were lots of people in town. I know of a lot of people in town that, uh, make movies some of them are hobbyists some of them are aspirational to be professionals some of them are students um it's just a big wider range of people i know that live in my town that do things similar to what i do and and a lot of people i've seen this happen a lot and i've seen this happen in big cities where people are like maybe threatened or or rivalries spring up with people that, make, <laughs> that are doing similar things uh, and, yeah yeah so, so what I did was I contacted all those filmmakers via email. I, if I didn't know their email, I found out. I, I think I had about 15 or 20 people that I recognized as this person's a filmmaker and they live in my town. And um, I invited them to come for free to the screening. No, it was a discount. It was a deep discount, like half off. You come and I want you to sit at the table with me. Like I want us to have a filmmaker table. So as we're watching the movie, as everybody's hanging out, we're all going to be together as filmmakers. Right. And people love that. People like totally responded to that. Now think about that from a, a human response thing. Like everybody wants to be special. Everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be appreciated for what they did. I'm not, this isn't, I'm not just doing a manipulative evil thing and saying, oh, come sit at my table. I'm trying to honor the people that work uh, just as hard as, as I do to make the things they make. But those people came and all those people brought all their friends mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that paid the full price to come. Yeah. And then at the, the event, I asked those people to stand up and I recognized them and say, this is, you know, so-and-so he's a filmmaker and he makes great stuff. You should look at his page on YouTube. This is so-and-so he's a student. You know, I recognize those people and they, they felt celebrated. I got great feedback on my movie, just sitting around the table, you know, criticism and pos positive, you know, reinforcement of what I was doing. And everybody left feeling a little bit. I think those filmmakers felt like they were a part of something. They felt like they were uh, industry people that night, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I sold more tickets. And then after that, they're all my friends now. Like, so... So I think if we if we start thinking as filmmakers, if we start thinking about these things we do and our approach to audience development and building, you know, kind of like people approach any kind of business or any kind of or think of it as retail. I want to give you a product and service. I want to give you an experience that you enjoy, that it's meaningful to you and that you think about the next day and have no regrets that you participated in. And I want to create it in such a way that it really serves those other people not just myself because because hey it it certainly is going to serve me if i have a lot of people uh spend money and engage with my work right it means that i can make these strange little southern david lynch movies you know like unbecoming and still fill the room with people yeah you know i i i kind of in a lot of ways it's like I'm getting away with it. I'm getting away with being a film artist and living in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> Everybody's happy about it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that's great. Actually, I had, um, you know, I, I had made a feature uh, feature film for $500 without a crew. And then what I did for my premiere was to um, bring all, I'm up here in Portland, Oregon. So I brought a handful of filmmakers I had worked with and I admired some of their work. And you put on a networking event. So it was called the first annual uh, Suck Up Awards presented by Film Trooper. <laughs> it was just, it was literally just blatantly it's me great. sucking up to them. But I brought yeah. them together and I gave them an award. It was, um, and but we got a chance to show either the trailer or the short film of everybody's work uh, prior to the premiere of my feature film. So it's one of those things like, I mean, you're right, it, to make sure it was about them. And to talk about venues, I had made sure that it was a one of the theaters. A couple of things: it was one to make sure there's parking. Like, the, like there's it made it yeah. made it easy. It wasn't a hassle. People could park, find it, and get to the theater. The other thing was make sure the theater was small enough so that it did feel like you know, even though there are a handful of people might show up, it still felt that was it was full. 
And the last thing was to make sure there was a accessible bar nearby afterwards. Like so, there was yeah. a one right across the street. I've been at events where I would I went to a premiere, and then all of a sudden we had to walk blocks. Like, where's this place? And like, and it, it was like number one, the parking was terrible to get there. It was like couldn't find parking, and then you get to the event, then you get through it, and then you're like, we have to walk three more blocks to a bar. And it was just one of those things. Like, as somebody who's been at those things, you're like, well, how can I make my event different to make when you really start thinking about the the, the experience of the audience everything like that because even if your film was halfway decent as long as they had a good time they might go yeah it was a pretty good film <laughs> <laughs> right 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 uh, you know uh, this is a portland story and it totally relates to um um the idea of audience building um so i had this uh, cinema purgatorio movie that's uh, a showbiz comedy mm -hmm. which would be the genre and i noticed uh, in 2014 that it was it happened to be the 25th anniversary of a showbiz comedy that I really liked a movie by Christopher Guest oh. called The Picture yeah yes. it happened to be the 25th anniversary so I kept thinking man I want to go to LA and see if somebody would do a screening of that and then piggyback it with CP with Cinema Purgatorio mm -hmm. and um, I have a, f a couple friends in Portland and I started thinking about it and uh I called the Clinton Street Theater. That's where I was at. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's so a great I, theater, yeah. And uh, I think uh, Lanny Joe. Yeah, was, uh, they they took over yeah. a couple years ago, right? Yeah. So, okay, so I, I called them and just said, hey, you know, what if, could you guys book Christopher Guest's movie? We'll, we'll, we'll ask him if he'll come. You know, we'll send him a letter and all this. But I really want to have a reason to go to Portland and meet people and show my work in Portland. And so, um, can I, if I come, will you show my movie cinema purgatory? It'll be a double build. Yeah. We'll show, um, you know, uh, Christopher Guest's movie first and then my movie and there, it worked. It, I mean, we did not fill the theater mm -hmm. by any, means, but I left Portland with at least half a dozen, maybe a dozen new film, friends and, and and i mean i was at sarasota film festival and saw uh josh leak do you know josh oh, yeah 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 uh, P okay so, film festival, yeah. yeah so i'm hanging out with him at sarasota in florida having also met him at clinton street theater like i created a little network of friends and connection to that city yeah and and i paid for a plane ticket and crashed on you know like i didn't spend a lot of money to go to portland but i i got to show my film and then to my to my mailing list back home, I said, "Hey, I just went to Portland to screen <laughs> Purgatorio with Christopher Guest's Big Picture." Yeah, my favorite showbiz comedies. Man, there's just so many wins in that scenario. Yeah, yeah. Everybody involved. What what bar did you go to after your showing? Oh, I, it's it's uh, there was well actually before we went to a place I don't remember. Was it right across the street? I did go to right across the street. Probably Dots um, Cafe, maybe. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, that's a great one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was after, but before we were down the street at some place a little fancier with some friends that had come up from L.A. to, to see the movie with us. But, you know, again, um, th that that uh, worked for me in getting my film and kind of getting into Portland a little bit, but it also worked for me communicating with people that are fans and friends of what I do. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's just a fun story, but I, you know, I know we're hitting about the hour mark here, but I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you more, a little bit more, like a little snippet of the story of a couple of things here. One, Ryan Johnson and Star Trek continues. Okay. What is your involvement with these? First of all, the Star Trek continues looks amazing so go ahead sure. i i leave it to you <laughs> okay so um so yeah so a few years ago when i was on my filmmaking journey an old friend of mine who happens to be a big anime voice actor his name is vic Mignana. i i was friends with vic when i lived in texas many years ago he a friend of a friend told him i was doing film and he was shooting a movie in georgia a, a star trek thing in georgia and he needed a first ad hmm. I, and 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 kind of a line producer you know yeah. he just needed and he needed somebody close that and we talked on the phone and i just thought it was kind of corny i was like oh and he said come down to the studio i'm gonna be working on the studio. come look at it come look at it. so <laughs> I drove down and i walk into this metal building in south georgia and it's like 
holy cow. And he goes, yeah, it's Desilu Studios, you know, 1968. I'm like, no kidding, man. This is unbelievable. It is like spectacular. And I wasn't familiar with anybody's Star Trek fan film. You know, I just, I yeah. knew the original series. But um, so I, I ended up um, becoming a producer on the show. I have I directed the episode with uh, Lou Ferrigno. Um, I wrote, uh, I've written for the show. I've, I even in the last episode, the fifth, episode the civil war episode i was an actor in it so um um it's a it's a spectacular amazing thing to behold um it's star trek continues.com check it out it is um, it is i just saw like the trailers <laughs> or snippets of the 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 scene like the shows it's bonkers how accurate it, it looks like yeah. the original i mean it's 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 like no joke like oh my god like this is is it this looks fantastic yeah, yeah. And uh, my connection to Ryan is um, when I was a high school teacher and I was getting antsy to not be a high school teacher, um, I uh, would always do something hopefully, you know, kind of strange and ambitious with my students. And I was trying to talk. I'd written a Johnny Quest play with some students the year before. Like ah. it's called uh, Teenage Johnny Quest in Tokyo. <laughs> so we were like bringing Johnny Quest alive on stage and all this. It was just crazy. And so I was trying to top myself and I. I thought of Brick, the movie mm -hmm. Brick, and like, man, that's a it's a film noir. It's very if you've not seen Brick, check oh, yeah. it out. It's noir set in a high school. It's not joking, you know. It's like it's total. It's not winking at the camera at all. It's like really that style of movie set in a high school. And um, I looked on the internet and tried to figure out some way that I could maybe get permission to do it. And I sent an email to somebody. Oh, I'd like to do Brick as a stage play, and Ryan responded. This is before brothers bloom came out okay and before like looper before star wars <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh and I, as i'm having this email conversation with ryan johnson he's like do it man yeah i was i was in drama in high school this sounds like the coolest thing ever yes 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 here's my you know a copy of the script you can just cut and paste if you need any help let me know so i start working on it and then as we get closer i'm like this thing is pretty good i'm kind of digging you know brick the play and so I reached out to Ryan and said, hey, it's coming pretty good. We, Is there any way you could come uh, to Greenville, South Carolina and see Brick the play? And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I could. And I'm like, well, we'll pay for it. You know, we'll put you up at a fancy hotel. And he goes, no, 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 I got it. I got it. I'll be there. So he came. Wow. And so, um, the, yeah, it was the last performance of Brick. Um, I sat with Ryan Johnson and, and watched the play. And since then... Um, um, Ryan has allowed the play to be done all over. Like I went to Australia with Brick the Play hmm. to a college in Sydney, did it. Just recently it was done up in Canada this past winter. Um, so, so yeah, it's like, uh, and if anybody listening knows a performing arts theater, you want to do Brick the Play, just let me know. We'll make it happen. We'll get you the script and uh, tell you all the things that work and don't work with Brick the Play and, and <laughs> your school do Brick the Play too. But yeah, and um, yeah, so uh, I, I, a bunch of my former students, when the word, when it was announced that he was going to direct Star Wars 8, I was just inundated with people going, are you kidding me? That's the guy, isn't it? I'm like, yeah. yeah. That's the guy. I hope you got your picture with him. <laughs> Because, yeah, he's a big director now. That is fantastic. Well, congratulations. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah sure. It's been an absolute pleasure, you know, just meeting you and talking to you and hearing the stories and, and hearing your uh, thought process and, you know, building your career as a business, as an independent, you know, filmmaker. Can I ask you one thing as we wrap up everything? Um, sure. You've heard stories like where the railroad business went out of business because they thought they were in the railroad business. And so when the, you know, automobile came in, they, you know, almost went bankrupt or Kodak went out of business because they thought they were in the photochemical processing business and not the business of like preserving memories. Where yeah. like where Apple is like been known to claim that they when they stopped being a computer company, they became a lifestyle business company or a lifestyle, you know, company. What is the business that you're in? Uh, well, I think, I mean, this is, I think we all, the reason why we're so transfixed by movies, I believe, and television and visual media, and even things like podcasts and radio shows, we're all trying to make sense of our lives mm -hmm. in some way. If you've had a good day, 
you want to celebrate if you're having a bad day you want to know why you should keep doing what you're doing and we look to a lot of very valuable legitimate ways to do that and i think that engaging with a story and experiencing a story is a great way to do that um i think my job and our job as filmmakers in that is is um I'm not, I don't know that it rises to the level of the, the word sacred, but I think it's very valuable and important. And I think, so what I'm doing is as an independent artist, as a creative entrepreneur, as this guy that lives in Greenville and makes films, I, I'm, I'm like, the, I'm like a, uh, I'm a, I'm a broker. Like uh, you're trying to figure out what to make of your life and how to figure it out and how to make it meaningful. And I'm ha trying to help you do that too. And so what my films and my stories and, and even talking to you about like what I do, I, I'm just, I'm just like this guy standing around and you're standing around. We're both trying to figure things out and we're just, we're just talking about it. And I'm saying, well, this worked for me. This is working for me. I don't know if this will work for you. And, and maybe somebody will go in and watch cinema purgatorio, you know, my film and see like, man, this guy totally gets what it's like to not quite be making it, but really wanting it. But, <laughs> you know, or maybe somebody will see one of the weird unbecoming movies and just say, you know, that, that was really touching and profound in a way I hadn't expected it to be, you know, um, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're in the business of relationships for the purpose relationships with other human beings for the purpose of, of all of us uh, figuring out why we're here and what we're doing while we're here. Mm -hmm. And I think it, 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 maybe you look at that, maybe that's hope. Maybe that's uh, creating a sense of purpose and narrative in our lives. Um, but I, I, that's certainly not that, <laughs> that's very aspirational and that's not going to like foot, put food on the table or, you know, win the Oscar or what, you know, all that stuff that we think about, but man, it's a good way to look at it when, you know, I'm working out a scene and sitting in my office and it's late at night and a little bing comes up on Facebook and it's some friend of mine who's asking me a question about some scene in my film. And I'm like, I have to write right now. And then I realize, oh, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like the filmmaker, this guy knows who just saw Hail Caesar and he he thought it was great, and he wants to ask me if I thought it was great too. Yeah, like I, I, we're we're fostering, you know, we have this relationship, and um, so yeah, I think that's what I do. I think that's what I do. Of course, the shot's got to be in focus. <laughs> <laughs> the performance has to be right. Uh, it could be out of focus, like Robin Williams was in that Woody Allen film. Was it? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 right, right, right. But but we don't want it to be yeah <laughs> but yeah yeah man that's i think what we're doing scott very good well it's a pleasure to meet you and uh the best of luck to you and i'll make sure everybody uh gets all the links to uh chriswhitehq.com and all the films you got you know pumping you know down the line keep us sure. yeah definitely keep us posted on the uh the fundraising for the next feature i will and thank you scott all right hey have a good one thanks chris you too. All See right, ya. bye now that concludes my interview with writer, director, and actor Chris White over in South Carolina. So if you're in that part of the United States, be sure to check out or look for him. I'm sure he'd be happy to meet up with you, and I hope you enjoy some of his work. And you can see what he's doing over at chriswhitehq.com. With that said, if you are stuck trying to make your film right now, then I offer you a free gear guide over at freegearguide.com. It's an equipment list of everything that I use to make my feature film, The Cube, for $500 with no crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. And it might just be the inspiration you need to get unstuck. <laughs> so thank you so much again for tuning in to another episode of the Film Trooper Podcast. And I will catch you next time. Film Trooper. Filmmaking freedom for the independent.